During the U.S. presidential campaign, Joe Biden made clear that his Middle East policy would be drastically different than his predecessor. And after his first full week in office, Biden is starting to show what that policy will be. Allies and adversaries alike are now seeing dramatic shifts from the past four years. Gone are the days of diplomacy by tweet and one-sided relationships. President Biden has restored relations with the Palestinian Authority, which were all but cut off by Donald Trump. The action signals a return to a more balanced approach towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It'll also mean the return of U.S. aid to the Palestinians and Washington's reaffirmed support for a two-state solution. U.S. allies Saudi Arabia and the UAE also got a wake-up call after the Biden administration said it was posing a string of weapons deals worth tens of billions of dollars. Included are the sale of the advanced F-35 fighter jets, which was signed on Trump's last full day in office. Newly confirmed U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also made clear that U.S. support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen was over. So, in just a week, we've seen a major pivot in U.S. policy. How far will it go and what other countries are set to see changes? To discuss the latest, joining me from New York is Mark Meyerowitz. He is a professor at the State University of New York who specializes in U.S. foreign policy. And Dalia Fahmi, who is a Middle East analyst and an associate professor of political science at LIU Brooklyn. Hi, Dalia. Hi, Mark. Welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. So, Dalia, in a latest move, Biden administration has halted the um, weapons sales to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, will not be able to buy F-35 jets uh, for the time being. What is your take on that? Um, it's, it's not exactly that they can't buy. It's that the, the sale is going to be reviewed because it went through just hours before the inauguration of, of the current President Biden. Um, but I think what we need to look at is that the uh, political landscape in the Middle East has shifted significantly since President Biden was, was vice president. Um, he, while he is no stranger to the Middle East and he has in his long career, he's visited many countries in many capacities, the political landscape has significantly shifted. If we think about, for example, the pillars of democracy, I'm sorry, the pillars of stability in the Middle East, historically, they've been, for example, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Yes. Today, yeah. Saudi Arabia has become a pillar of instability for the United States, um, especially in this protracted war in Yemen. And so what we're seeing in this first week um, and just in the first day of the new Secretary Secretary of State Tony Blinken, is that they're putting these countries on notice, is that the, there's a new status quo. And while both of these countries are having several internal changes, we're seeing that they're footprint in the Middle East is waning, while countries like Turkey, Qatar, um, and even the UAE, in a certain extent, they're increasing in their footprint. Um, the so-called normalization between the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Israel, um, brokered by the United States under the previous administration, is also shifting a little um, in this first week. And the Iran nuclear program, yes. the new discussions on possible negotiations of sanctions, <clears throat> the rising power of the UAE. It's a very different Middle East in the past four years. Yeah, and it's just yeah. only been a week uh, since he uh, is at the White House as president. So, uh, Mark, um, what kind of a message did the U.S. send to those car countries, particularly in your opinion? I don't see a very precipitous shift in policy. I'm going to be candid about it. Uh, if you listen to Tony Blinken and also to Jen Psaki in their press conferences, you have to listen very carefully. When Tony Blinken spoke about Saudi Arabia in connection with Yemen and sanctioning the Houthis, he called Saudi Arabia our partner. Yes. And when Jen Psaki spoke about our policy towards uh, China and other countries, they talked about strategic patience. And in the hearings, when Tony Blinken was asked about the Abraham Accords and the senators uh, questioning him, bipartisan, were supportive of it, he said in that hearing he was fine with it. I'm going to paraphrase it. And he also said it again in his press conference. I don't think the United States is going to shift precipitously uh, against the Abraham Accords uh, at the present time. Mm -hmm. Where the real focus is going to be is going to be, honestly, on domestic issues like the pandemic and the economy. That is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And if you're turning to foreign policy, the main issues there are China and Russia. But if you listen to the tone 
of how it's being discussed. It's all about we're competitors. Um, Biden reached out to the Russians, worked up a re-up of the deal. The United States is not making any precipitous steps in foreign policy to upend what occurred. I mean, they may look at it down the road, but not until they solve the pandemic. Yes. So in terms of the F-35s and the UAE and all of that, I would say that, yes, they're going to look at, <clears throat> at these arrangements. But the Middle East has changed in the sense that the countries that made the deal with Israel were focused on their fear of Iran. Yes. And as long as Iran is a threat, there's going to be glue together for that deal. The Iranian deal, I don't know if it's going to ever happen because the Iranians are being very intransigent on whether they're going to agree to more than just the Iran nuclear deal. That is the, uh, the tricky part. All President right. Biden says he wants to do it. All right. So, sure. um, Dalia, <clears throat> Biden also wants to end the war in Yemen. Is it as, as simple as ending military support to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, or it would take a more diplomatically active United States in the region? What has happened in U.S.-Saudi um, relations over the past couple of years is that um, we need to rethink how we look at, for example, the United States. It's not just the executive. Um, in, in Washington, we have the president, we have the Pentagon, but we also have military apparatus, CENTCOM. And there has been a division between the way they see U.S.-Saudi um, relations in the past couple of years. And one indicator of that is how upset many generals of the U.S. military are in the way with which the United States has allowed itself to get into a protracted conflict in Yemen that is not in U.S. strategic interest. And so what I believe we're going to see very quickly is that a return to what is U.S. military interest in the region? How is U.S. military footprint going to be re redefined? And how can U.S.-Saudi relations return to U.S. strategic interest rather than allowing the current leader of or so-called current leader of Saudi Arabia, yes. MBS, to push the United States in directions it strategically does not want to go into. And so what I think you will continue to see is a reduction of the U.S. footprint in Yemen. And we're starting to see that conversation begin with the new Secretary of State in terms of the designations of the Houthis. And so I do believe that there will be a significant shift in the way with which the status quo behavior, technically a little bit quid pro quo in the past four years, will be redefined between the United States and Saudi Arabia. So, uh, Mark, what happens when the U.S. administration declassifies the, the intelligent report into the murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi? Um, where does this leave the crown prince? Look, let's be realistic now. Let's be candid. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia is a longstanding ally of the United States. That's not going to change. And in terms of the military aspect of this, uh, we have civilian control of the military and the president controls the military. He's the commander in chief and the defense secretary is a general. That's true. But uh, so what the military commanders think or don't think, I don't believe is pivotal. I think what is pivotal here is the relationship with Saudi Arabia. And if you look at the Congress, I am not expecting it going forward again, any great upheavals in these relationships as far as the murder of Khashoggi. That is like many other disclosures that we've had that kind of rocked the boat. But at the end of the day, if you go back in history, you have the AWACS, the Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a longstanding ally. Um, and as far as the Houthis and Yemen, that conflict needs to end. But again, is it the United States that's going to get in there and get involved there? I think not. Mm -hmm. Because right now, as I said, the, the uh, immediate primacy of the foreign policy begins at home. I'm, I'm quoting Professor Richard Haas's book. That's what we have to fix now. So the United States is not going to have military footprints and military involvements in other parts of the world. Maybe that's what might come down the road. But right now, everything is about stability and patience. I heard Jen Psaki say that word patience so many times that I got convinced that the Biden administration, even if you listen to Tony Blinken's The Tone, of Tony Blinken's comments, uh, those comments are very yes. clearly not involved in intervention. And the military, again, is under the control of the civilian authorities and not on their own making decisions as to what they want to do, I don't think. Yeah, so just yeah. like uh, Saudi Arabia, Dalia, <laughs> Egypt is a longtime ally uh, of the United States. Would it be a new course or uh, business as usual? 
since um, President Biden was candidate Biden um, and throughout his history in, in the Senate, he has been talking about the redefinition of how we look at strategic interests using the language of, of democracy and human rights. And we've seen this reinforced in the past week um, and even on Saudi Arabia, not just on Egypt, where um, you know secretary, the new secretary of state says that there will be a, comp he said, a, a review of the entirety of the relationship. And while we might not see dramatic shifts, this language matters a lot because in the Middle East, you have several audiences. You have the political leadership of these countries, but you also have the people. And there are many interests that need to be kind of navigated in this regard. And while the, the pandemic will be and continue to be the, the primary focus here in the United States, countries like Lebanon, Iraq, Jordan, and Egypt will continue to expect support as they have to get back on their feet during the pandemic. Um, and so these questions about domestic politics versus international relations and foreign policy, they, they, we, we can't see them as separate circles. They're very concentric in many ways. And the pandemic's effect on the Middle East will affect the stability of a country like Egypt, which is teetering, especially on the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring, on a country where 70% of the population is on the brink of poverty. Um, add to that the pandemic, it's it's not a country that's going to be able to sustain the status quo stability in the region vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Libya on one end and Sudan and the, and the, and the Nile damming on the other. Li separate from the fact that the UAE's footprint is increasing and Russia's footprint is increasing right on its doorstep in, in Libya. And so the region cannot be ignored um, because of domestic politics. The region is is extremely on the, could be seen as on the brink of a redefinition of the status quo. Saudi Arabia and Egypt are no longer the pillars of stability. Yes, they are US strategic partners. We need them for things like Camp David, flyover rights, Sinai, um, Suez Canal, as, as, as well the security and safety of the state of Israel. So who but will be the strategic partner? I think the strategic partners are going to be redefined in the Gulf. It's not primarily Saudi Arabia. It's increasingly the UAE. And with the lifting of the GCC's um, sanctions on, on Qatar, increasingly Qatar, Turkey will play an increasing role in the region as it has been for the past five to six years. Um, but the, def the, the relationships will be redefined because in the past four years, Russia has been able to increase its footprint. And so U.S.-Turkey relations will be redefined in that regard. Um, um, especially in the sales of arms from Russia to Turkey, but also in terms of Turkey's increasing footprint in Syria and in Libya. Possibly, I'm sorry, Russia's increasing mm -hmm. footprint in, in Syria and in Libya, which could possibly destabilize aspect of, of U.S. relations in that part of the world. And so while we can talk about domestic politics, we can't ignore the changing status quo that's shifted dramatically in the past four years and will call for a, re a reconsideration of the way with which the United States has been treating its allies in, in the Arab Middle East. So now adopting a more balanced approach towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Mark, um, is that two-state solution possible now? And where does this leave Israel and, of course, Netanyahu? Right. Look, um, uh, again, to be realistic, I don't believe that in the, if you have the, um, if you're making a list of the primary issues, the Middle East is not on that high on that list. Uh, regrettably, I mean, it should be. Um, it's not going to be. The main issues are China and Russia. Uh, and even there, the United States is not being very aggressive. Iran, obviously, the nuclear deal, that's kind of the pivot of the United States policy right now. About Saudi Arabia and Egypt, I don't see any great change as far as Israel and the Palestinians. The Israel-Palestinian issue, I'm afraid, will not be high on that agenda because of the Abraham Accords. Listening to Tony Blinken on that, and if you listen to the hearings, the discussion of this issue was relegated to just a few minutes and a commitment to a two-state solution, but not really a pivotal discussion in terms of America's foreign policy. Now, about Turkey, obviously, Turkish-U.S. relations is very, very important. We need to have good relations with Turkey, and we need to get over this Russian intervention in the region and try to see what we can do to limit Russia's intervention. We can see the nefarious actions of Russia and we just have to be very careful, and Turkey should be very careful about its continued alliance with Russia. All right. Um, uh, its, its, its trajectory is with the United States, not with Russia. Russia is not a, uh, a faithful partner, I don't okay. think. Um, and I think.
anyway. Okay, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk, and please stay safe there.